Hey, I'm Sam. Welcome to Brickwall Pictures. Today I'm doing a Robert Rodriguez tier list. Rodriguez is a filmmaker that I've been wanting to get to for a while. I held off on him because I wanted to make this list as comprehensive as possible. And that meant I had to seek out the last couple of his projects I hadn't seen yet, which were Alita Battle Angel and Red Eleven were the two I needed to, to track down. And I eventually just watched uh, Red Eleven last night. I have a shit ton of uh, tier lists at this point, so go check those out. If you haven't seen them already, there will be a playlist down in the description. So Robert Rodriguez was actually one of the first filmmakers that I had wanted to do a tier list for, and then it just took me a long time to catch up on those last couple of things. I do have most of his work. I even have some like little tiny projects that I probably don't like need to include, but I'm going to anyway. Um, but even still, he does have a couple of extra things I haven't seen. It's mostly just his like later kids movies. I have some of his kids movies in here. I have the kids movies that he made while I was a child, while I was in the target age range. But I haven't seen uh, Shorts is one that he has. And I haven't seen We Can Be Heroes or We Could Be Heroes or whatever it is, the, uh, his new one that's like set in the, that has like Shark Boy Love Girl in it, but it's like a spin-off thing. I haven't seen that one just because you know, I'm not in the age range for it anymore, so I'm not going to evaluate it. With his kids' movies that are in here, which are basically the first three Spy Kids movies. I didn't do the fourth one because that came out after I had aged out of them. But I have the first three Spy Kids movies, and I have Shark Boy and Lava Girl. And I'm going to be rating those based on how I liked them as a child, because I've not gone back and revisited them. And his kids' movies are definitely of the variety where they work for kids, and they do not at all work for adults, and they're not trying to. There's... A lot of kids' movies will do the thing where, like, they have jokes that the adults can enjoy that will go over the kids' heads, or they try to make, like, family movies that the whole family can enjoy. Robert Rodriguez is decidedly not going for that. He is making movies for kids. His movies are almost, like, by kids for kids because he has his own children help out in, like, the writing process, which I think is, you know, maybe makes for a weirder and potentially messier film, but it is kind of valiant in a way. It's like the closest you can get to a movie that comes directly from the imagination of a child aimed at children rather than an adult on their own trying to recapture that childlike imagination. And I think that is what lends his kids' movies a distinctive kind of air that sets them apart in both some good ways and some bad ways if you're like an adult looking back on them. Robert Rodriguez was a really important filmmaker for me, um, particularly because he was uh, alongside Tarantino. He was like one of the first filmmakers that I got really into, got kind of obsessed with, started like studying his body of work and watching his movies over and over and over again. Check out my Tarantino tier list or any other videos that I've talked about Tarantino on here to find out how he helped. Like I call it my passport to cinema. He kind of like opened the door to world cinema and like when I was young he had me figure out like what a director is, what a director does, all that sort of thing. So I owe him a lot in that regard. Robert Rodriguez is uh, close friends with Quentin Tarantino in real life, if you didn't know. They've worked together a whole bunch of times. They both liked what each other does. And then it's interesting the vibe between them where, like, Tarantino rejects digital, rejects CGI, generally speaking, whereas Rodriguez was actually one of the earliest adopters of digital filmmaking over film. Like, he started off in film with El Mariachi, shot for $7,000 on film, which was one of the biggest expenses of the movie. He very early on adopted digital filmmaking, and he changed up his whole workflow. Like, Sin City was one of the first, like, all green screen shot movies. He switched over to digital cameras. Like, if you watch Desperado, and then you watch Once Upon a Time in Mexico, between those two movies is when he switched from, di from film to digital, and you can hear him describe the difference in process where like with digital he can just roll camera constantly be rolling and then grab shots here and there whereas with film he had to be more economical and only roll when they're like ready for the shot and stuff um i've seen hundreds of hours of like behind the scenes footage of his movies because uh like i said he was one of those instrumental filmmakers for me when i was first learning like when i was making my first shitty short films in middle school and high school, Rodriguez was one of those key voices for me alongside Tarantino. I always kind of viewed them as like a double team, you know, based on their collaborations on like Grindhouse and From Dusk Till Dawn and Four Rooms. But anyway, that's enough about that. Let's get started with the ranking. We have a lot, we have a lot of titles to cover here. This is probably going to be one of the longer tier lists, but we're, let's get started with Machete because these are in their randomized order as usual. Machete is an interesting film because it started life as a fake trailer within the Grindhouse double feature. Robert Rodriguez made Planet Terror, Quentin Tarantino made Death Proof, 
and they were packaged together in the Grindhouse double feature that had like advertisements and bumpers and in the middle fake trailers. And then there were fake trailers made by Rob Zombie, Edgar Wright, Eli Roth, and Robert Rodriguez himself made one of these fake trailers, which was Machete, which was so beloved that it then took on a life of its own and became its own movie. Um, like a full movie, they made the trailer first and expanded it into the movie. It's kind of interesting to compare the two because you can notice that Rodriguez used some of the literal exact same shots in the Machete trailer and the Machete feature film. But then there are other times where things were changed to fit the narrative. And you can see like they swapped out some actors. Like in the movie, uh, Shea Wiggum is a big, he's an actor that I love, by the way. He's a great, great underappreciated character actor. He's in Machete the movie. He wasn't on board when they did uh, the trailer. So in the trailer, you can see a different actor. It's this bald guy instead, who I think is just like a friend of Rodriguez. I don't even think that guy's in like a full-time actor necessarily, which is something Rodriguez does. In Planet Terror, he included like his real estate agent and his dentist. He just like puts them in the movie for the hell of it, you know? Robert De Niro in the feature film version. And you add like Steven Seagal, you add other people, which but I, I am on record as not at all liking Steven Seagal. I think he's a, a douchebag, right? He's okay in this. He's This is probably the most enjoyable role I've seen from him. I still don't like the guy, but he's in it and he has a sword fight and whatever. It's, it's kind of funny. He's utilized well. Um, Robert De Niro is actually utilized pretty well as, uh, also. Michelle Rodriguez is fun. Her character is super over the top. Uh, Jessica Alba's okay. I don't think she's great or anything, but she's okay. Daryl Sabara is in this one. He was in... Spy Kids. He's like Junie from Spy Kids. He's in this as uh, older now, you know. He's whatever. His character kind of doesn't have too much of a purpose in the movie, but whatever. And then the other spy kid, uh, Alexa Vega, who I think is Alexa Pena Vega now, or Pena Vega or whatever. She is in the sequel, Machete Kills. And with her, it's kind of weird because like, she's like really sexualized in Machete Kills. And I guess on his own, that would be fine. But it's just, it seems weird that like, dude, you were directing her when she was a child and now you're going to put her in this like really sexualized role and wardrobe and stuff. It's just something weird about that of having worked with her in those different periods in her life. I don't know. It seems seems strange. A little off-putting about that. I don't know. Maybe it doesn't bother other people. I don't know. Danny Trejo, of course, in the lead role is, he's great. Danny Trejo is like, he's an actor I love, but he is in a lot of bad shit. He's in a lot of awful movies and he's aware of that. Like it, it's not like he makes any bones about that, you know? Good dude in real life, does lots of like charity work and stuff. His restaurant in Los Angeles is really cool, by the way. Uh, he has like, he has a brand of hot sauce and salsa and stuff. And um, there's, there'll be like a, a bumblebee on the bottle, but it's like his face on the bumblebee. It's funny. He is at his best cinematically when he's working with Robert Rodriguez. Rodriguez just like knows how to utilize him the best. He's given him so many badass roles and like knows his strengths and plays to them. He, of course, plays Machete in Machete, but he also plays Uncle Machete in Spy Kids. There's another instance of him playing two roles in... He's in Desperado as one character who gets killed off, and then he comes back in the sequel, Once Upon a Time in Mexico, as a different character. Machete is so much fun. It's extremely over-the-top. You need to go in knowing that it's supposed to be heightened over-the-top. It's continuing the Grindhouse style of the Grindhouse movie. One thing I don't like about it is that um, it ditches the grindhouse visual aesthetic insofar as it's like grainy film. It only has that for the first, uh, like the like opening chapter of the movie, the like prologue. Once it jumps forward, it then looks glossy and digital again, and I don't like that. It's fine. You might not even notice it in the first movie. It's the second movie where it, it gets a little too far away from its grindhouse roots for me, but I'll talk about that when I get to Machete Kills. Machete is so much fun. The action is great and it's over the top. My favorite like beat of action in this is the intestine swing. He's in a hospital and he guts a guy, runs with his intestines, leaps out a window and like bungee swings down into the next window. That is so great. That's like quintessential Robert Rodriguez action right there. Super fun movie. I would give Machete an A. Uh, and that's going in knowing it's it's a throwback to old grindhouse movies that are ridiculous and over the top and you know it's doing some things bad intentionally it's all part of the charm you got to be on board with that okay next up uh let's see what i want to grab here. i'll grab bedhead this was rodriguez's first short film this actually like earned him some acclaim right off the bat it, it predates el mariachi i think it did well in festivals it won some festivals when i finally watched it i i didn't really get the acclaim for it uh it doesn't really feel to me like 
uh, it's showing the promise he has as a filmmaker. It looks like a, I don't think it's a very good short film, honestly. Um, I guess maybe before it's time, it was different, but I, as someone who's been to a lot of film festivals, I've seen like dozens of short films that do the same thing as Bedhead. Obviously this one came first, but I would be surprised if it came like actually first. It came before all those ones I've seen at, you know, recent film festivals. But I would still be surprised if it was like the first one to do this concept and to do this style. I don't know. I, I don't really like Bedhead very much. Um, it is, you know, it's obviously it's like no budget. It's his roots. I think it's like his own family in the movie, you know. Um, I don't think it's really worth watching unless you're a hardcore Rodriguez fan and you want to see his roots. I'm going to put it down in E. Next up is Spy Kids. I think I'm going to talk about the three Spy Kids movies in a row, so I'm going to grab all three of these. I'm not going to give them the same ranking, but um, I will say, so if you go back and watch Spy Kids now, like I've gone back and watched clips just to like refresh my memory, and I've seen a couple like YouTube videos about it, but I haven't like gone back and actually sat down and watched them since I was a kid in the, those age range. As a kid, I fucking loved this series, and this is before I like knew Robert Rodriguez, the filmmaker. I just liked them because they were you know, kids' movies. I wasn't like a fan of, like, I didn't know about the Tarantino connection and all that at this point. I didn't know who Robert Rodriguez was at this point. I just enjoyed these movies as a, as a, as a child, you know. I loved these movies. I wanted to be a spy as a little kid, even, like, before seeing these movies. It just seemed like a cool job, which is what this movie's capitalizing on. And that's why it comes from, like, the imagination of an actual child, his own children helping the process and all that. Kids want to be spies. It's an alluring job for a, for a young, innocent mind. Um, I watched these movies over and over and over again as a kid, and I absolutely loved them. Um, at least the first two. I love the first two. The third one, I still watched over and over and over again, but I do remember having some major issues with it, even as a kid, like not liking it as much. And that might just be by virtue of like me being a little bit older by the time that one came out. It's possible. I do think there's a step down in quality in that one, though. Like, there's way more... Um, there's already tons of visual effects in the first two, but they look awful in the third one. Even as a kid, they just they look horrific, some of the special effects. Not as bad as Sharp Boy and Lava Girl, but they look pretty bad. I think, as kids' movies... Now, I don't know how well these hold up or whatever. I'm just going to rank these on my memory as... A, enjoying them as a kid. I think they do still hold up for children. If, like, a... If children today were to watch them, like if you're a parent and you're like, should I show these movies to my kids? I think your kids will still like them. As kids' movies, I'm going to put them firmly in B, which should B is like for good, solid stuff. It takes a lot to get an A. It takes a hell of a lot to get an S. So I could still put it lower. I'm going to put this one all the way down in D. I still watched it a lot as a kid, so I won't go any lower. I think a lot of people might put it all the way down in F. I still watched it so many times as a kid that I'm going to put it up in D, but I even... Even as a kid, I was like, this one is not as good. Okay, Desperado. Desperado is the middle film in Rodriguez's Mexico trilogy. It follows up El Mariachi, which was his first feature, his movie that he uh, famously made for $7,000, one of like, the cheapest movies ever made. Desperado was a major leap in terms of budget and just in terms of, in terms of like scope and quality. Desperado is a big action movie, and the action is so fucking good. Uh, this is Rodriguez working in his sweet spot with like great shootouts, great like gags within the action sequences. That bar shootout is like one of the best movie shootouts ever. It's that fucking good. And the whole movie around it is very good. It's really funny. Uh, Buscemi is great in his supporting role. Selma Hayek is excellent in her supporting role. The bad guy isn't the most memorable, but he's still, he's effective. He replaces the bad guy from the first movie. There's a little bit of weirdness with it being a sequel to El Mariachi because the first one obviously did not have Antonio Banderas. He's coming in to fill the role, which was previously just filled by one of, Rodri one of Robert Rodriguez's buddies, this guy Carlos, who's not like really an actor. He's been in a couple other things, but he doesn't really have like an acting career outside of of being in Rodriguez's movies. Carlos is still in Desperado, though. Carlos is one of Banderas's two friends that he calls him when he needs backup. One of the guys who has the... He's the one who has the machine gun guitar cases. His other friend is the one with the rocket launcher. Danny Trejo was great at his supporting role. I think he is a completely silent character. Maybe he says something that I forget. Maybe he does have dialogue. I think he might not have any dialogue. Oh, Cheech Marin is great in his role. He's fun. Cheech Marin is another guy who comes back in Once Upon a Time in Mexico, and in that one he's like got the eye patch and all that. The other guy in the bar, by the way, with Cheech Marin, unless I'm mistaken, that guy is Rodriguez's bandmate, 
they're in a band together. I think their band is Chingon. And that's also the scene where Tarantino has his cameo, which is a brilliant cameo. He comes in and he tells a, a joke and then he gets got, he gets, he gets yeeted, he gets shot in the fucking head. Great action movie. It's really excellent. I think, um, now I probably have a lot of nostalgia for it. I think I'm going to go all the way S for my personal <laughs> ranking. I love every second of this movie. But I think putting it in A would be fair as well. Or even in B. But uh, I'm going to go S just for my, my personal like investment in that one. Your next up is From Dusk Till Dawn. This movie is one that I talked about on my Tarantino tier list. I don't think I've talked about it in other videos as well. I fucking love From Dusk Till Dawn with all my heart. Um, I love the structure of it. I love that it blindsides you becoming this crazy, gory vampire film halfway through with like no inkling of that in the lead up. I love all that stuff. That's the kind of like radical subversion that I'm trying to do in, uh, in my own work. By the way, I have a new horror novel that I uh, was just published by Hellbound Books. Check out South of the Mason Dixon. Grab yourself a copy today. Link will be down in the description. Um, anyway, I talked a lot about From Us Thumb before on my other tier list. I love this movie. For me, it's another S tier movie. Um, it's that good. Okay, next up, let's grab Road Racers. I think this is one that fewer people will have seen. This one's a little more obscure. This was, I think, technically a TV movie. Actually, it's like a TV movie of the week. It was made for the series that I believe was called Rebel Highway. And Road Racers was like one of the installments in it. I don't know how easy it is to find. I doubt it's like streaming anywhere. I found my copy of it in the like Walmart $5 DVD bin one day. And I was like, oh, that's, I recognize that title from Rodriguez's uh, IMDb from scouring that over and over again. So I grabbed myself a copy. It feels very low budget and very low stakes. It is pretty good though. It has Selma Hayek and she's great. And it has David Arquette and he's, he's good at it too. He's, he's cool in the role. Um, I really liked the spirit behind this one. Like I watched the behind the scenes for it, of course, because I did that for all of uh, Rodriguez's stuff. And he talked about how their budget was so low and he's kind of like aware that it's not like the best script ever. It doesn't have like the highest aspirations. And he gave some advice in there that I really liked. And he, he talked about how he's trying to maximize the enjoyment by finding any little moment or any little like quirk that the actors can do that will like just add a little bit of pizzazz to any given scene. That's why, like, uh, there's one little moment where David Arquette's character, like, flips a cigarette and catches it in his mouth. And that's in the movie just because David Arquette could do that. So Rodriguez put it in the movie because it added just that little tiny little something extra because the movie needed that little something extra. I think that's good advice for doing, like, a low-budget thing is, like, looking for little tiny details you can add or little, like tricks like if your actor is good with like sleight of hand maybe you can find a way to weave that into the story in some small way and it'll just add a little extra a little extra like well cherry on top of, of any given scene so i think it's good for that reason road races is pretty simple it's not really an action movie there's a tiny bit of action in it but it's kind of one of those movies where like it promises a lot of action and then doesn't quite deliver on that there is a little bit but it's very brief and it's like at the very end um there's one funny moment i remember where it's set in like, you know, biker era, like 50s kind of style. I don't remember the actual year it's set in, but it's that kind of, it's like a throwback to those old movies. And Arquette's character is like a greaser, like a classic greaser. And there's this bit where they're in like a roller rink, I think it is, like a roller skating rink. And he applies like a shit ton of the like hair gel, you know, like because he's a greaser, right? And he does this thing, or maybe it's a different character actually, but someone does this thing where they like, put their head down on the floor as they're rolling and they create like an oil slick behind them that trips up all the other people. That's really funny and creative. So there's a good like moments. The overall narrative isn't really anything special. It's a little too simplistic and straightforward. I would say if you happen across it and you're a Rodriguez fan, it's worth a watch, but it's not really worth going out of your way to seek out given how like hard it is to find. I'm going to put it in C tier. Okay, next up is Red Eleven, is his most recent movie at the time of recording. Uh, this was him going back to his roots, like with El Mariachi. It was like the, I think, 25th anniversary of El Mariachi or some other anniversary. And he was like, to celebrate it, I'm going to return to my roots and want to make another movie for $7,000. Now it's, it's a little different because like now he's shooting digitally, which saves a shit ton of money versus shooting on film. But he's doing this thing where he's going back to like no crew. Actually, he had his son help him out. His son, whose name is Racer Max. His kids all have 
interesting names. The thing with Red 11 is it's like admirable to return to your roots and there's an inspirational quality to it for like low budget filmmakers such as myself and such as maybe some of you watching because there is such a high barrier to entry with filmmaking when it comes to budget. So with Red 11, it's admirable. Uh, I was looking forward to it. I, it, it, it's worth it for the like inspirational component, I guess, and the like, curiosity of it, see what he does with it. But it is not, it does not stand up on its own as a movie. El Mariachi stands up on its own as a movie, and it's impressive as hell for $7,000, and it, it works well. It's like a good movie. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, Red 11 is, it's just bad. It's, it's a really bad movie, uh, even for a $7,000 movie. It does it it like pales in comparison to El Mariachi. It's not even close. Um, and you know I want to give it a pass because of the budgetary thing, but at the same time a lot of its problems aren't even budget dependent. Like, okay, so the acting in it is like dog shit across the board. That you can attribute to the budget, t to a degree, right? But then other things like the color grading looks horrible. That you cannot attribute to the to the budget. Obviously the lighting has got to be more simplistic. You can, you can attribute the weak lighting to it, but the color grading, the fact that the color temperature is constantly changing, that's not a budgetary thing. Every editing program has built in color grading software. Rodriguez can color grade his own movie, his whole, his one man crew thing. He can color grade a little better. You know what I mean? Like that's not budgetary. Most of the problems are in the script. You can write another draft of the script without that inflating the budget. You know, like you don't have to shoot the first rough draft that you put together of the thing. That's not a budgetary thing. Um, with Red 11, I, I wrote up a kind of a longish uh, letterbox review from Red 11. Go check out my letterbox for some extra thoughts on Red 11. I, I log pretty much every movie I watch on letterbox if you want to keep up with my uh, day by day movie watching. Pretty much log everything I put on there. Either a quick little something or like a longer ish review. Red 11 got a longer one because there are a lot of problems that I point out some like plot holes and whatnot in there. The actual quality level of Red 11 is genuinely F tier. I think it's the worst thing Rodriguez has made. Um, and I'm talking like even relative to the budget, it's like the worst thing he's made. I am going to bump it up one though because of the like inspirational component to it because of the budgetary thing. I would still recommend checking out the there's like a six part making of series that accompanies the movie. And that is kind of like part of the movie. Um, like the introduction to Red 11, he, he explains how it's, how it was made and why, and he talks about the making of series. So that's still worth watching. There's a lot of value to be gleaned from that, even though the actual end product is not, is not really good at all. Anyway, okay, next up, let's grab Once Upon a Time in Mexico. This was the conclusion to his Mexico trilogy. This was the follow-up to Desperado. It came out uh, a few years later. Uh, it's a much bigger movie than uh, Desperado. It has a, a larger cast. It's more ambitious in some ways. I don't think it is as good as Desperado, though. Um, in getting bigger, it also gets a little goofier in some ways that are funny, in some ways that are uh, messy. It's still got a lot going for it. Like, there's some great action sequences. That whole car chase is wonderful. The part where he, like, rams the motorcycle into the back of the convertible and lands in the driver's seat, that's great. Um, Danny Trejo's part is, again, a lot of fun. The, like, surfing down the stairs on the guitar case is awesome. There's lots of really cool action. Johnny Depp's character is fun on this. He's, like, a CIA agent who wears a fake arm, <laughs> and that's a lot of fun on its own. But then he also has this thing where his eyes get removed and he's like a blind gunfighter, which is like, you need a hell of a lot of suspension and disbelief. It's really ridiculous and over the top. It is fun though. It's got the kind of like mythical, like like myth-making quality to it, which is interesting. Um, Salma Hayek is not in it enough. I think she must have been like busy on another production or something because her role is like, it's like they wrote her out of the movie pretty much. She's only in it for a couple minutes, even though she's like huge on the poster and she was a big part of Desperado. You feel her absence in this, I would say. Also, they kind of like replace the first two of his mariachi band buddies with the guitar kiss guns with like two different guys. And those guys aren't as memorable or fun, even though I think they have like more screen time and they probably have like more dialogue and more character. The two in, the, in Desperado don't actually do all that much, but I guess it's because their weapons are more memorable in the way that they're introduced and they have like a big action that's it is works a little better what's funny about mexico it's rough around the edges uh it's definitely not s i don't know if it's a or b 
Uh, I think I'm going to put it in B. Okay, next up is the director's chair. This is one you might not be familiar with. This is a nonfiction, like, interview show, basically. It's basically Rodriguez interviewing director friends of his, or just, like, other filmmakers. And so, like, you can see on this poster here, Tarantino was one of his guests, of course, because they're buddies. But he also interviews uh, Michael Mann. They have a really interesting conversation. He interviews uh, Guillermo del Toro. Lots of, lots of big, high-level filmmakers on this show. And I really like this side of Rodriguez, the side that's just, like, brimming with passion for filmmaking. One of the things Rodriguez does that a lot of filmmakers don't do is he really does champion like the younger generation of filmmakers on the way up. He goes out of his way to like give good advice and insights into filmmaking and provide like a sort of aspirational figure for people. And I think that's really commendable. And I, and I love that about him. The director's chair is really good. Um, you can find clips on YouTube. It's kind of hard to find the full episodes because it aired on, he has his own TV station, it's called the El Rey Network, which I think is named after the character El Rey from Planet Terror. I don't know how you watch the El Rey Network. I guess maybe you have to have cable, or maybe it's an add-on channel or something. Whatever it is, I don't have. I, you know, I did the, I don't have cable, and I don't have whatever service this is on, so I've only seen clips of it. But I have found the full interviews with a bunch of people, and they're really good conversations. It's all put together, and the guests are like top-tier filmmakers. Like, how often do you get to hear a in-depth conversation between two filmmakers like Robert Rodriguez and Michael Mann, you know, like there's a lot of good insights to be gleaned. I think for what it is, it's like A tier in its category of like like a film craft interview series. It's like A tier in that regard. Very next up, let's grab El Mariachi. I already talked about its two sequels, but El Mariachi was the first one. This was his $7,000 movie. This movie is, it's not perfect. It is rough around the edges, but it is a really good movie relative to its budget. Whereas Red Eleven, even relative to its budget, it's it's bad. El Mariachi has not a ton of action, but what action it does have is really impressive. It's so impressive what he was able to cobble together for seven thousand dollars. Like the whole stunt with the bus and the zip line and all that. It's and even just like the the general shootout stuff is so impressive. And when you watch El Mariachi, I will say you gotta watch like the behind the scenes stuff and read about the behind the scenes stuff because it will just get infinitely more impressive how he was able to pull it together like you can watch the action scenes and be like wow this is really good for for the budget even just knowing that but then you watch the behind the scenes and you learn that like the guns that they're using like the little mac 10 that the guy's firing in, the, in that one scene for example was like a gun that rodriguez somehow got the local uh police in that mexican village that he shot in they, the police let him borrow the real guns and that's what he's using and the fact that like to get the muzzle flashes, this is pre-CG, pre-VFX. He would he, he does VFX muzzle flashes in, in the future, but at this point, that's not a thing. So he's making his own squibs. And to use the flash paper for, like, the muzzle flashes of the Mac-10 going off, it gets even more impressive when you learn that, like, since it was a real gun, it would fire one of these flash paper rounds, and then the gun would jam. So he had to edit it in a way where he it, the guy's supposed to be shooting an automatic weapon, but he could only fire one bullet in each shot and that's resetting. So he had to like creatively edit around that and use uh, sound design to like sell that it's multiple shots. Stuff. All that stuff is, is is just so impressive. There's a lot of ingenuity shown. And for more than anything else, El Mariachi is just, it's one of those truly inspirational films for like young filmmakers. This movie meant a lot to me and I'm sure countless other people who wanted to get into filmmaking. In a similar way that like Clerks, for example, is really impressive as impressive and inspirational as a low budget film that took off and launched a career and, and all that. I'm gonna go ahead and put that in A. And that is factoring in these inspirational elements on its own as a movie, purely as a movie, and it's not an A tier movie. You have to take into account its its budget and the like inspirational side of things, the indie uh, guerrilla style of it all. Okay, next up let's grab Sin City. Sin City is such a perfectly badass movie. It's so cool. I've seen this movie a million times. Watched it over and over again. The same thing I can say about From Rest to Dawn and Desperado and El Mariachi. Watched all those just over and over and over again. Sin City has such a good grasp of style and like cool factor. It's a great cast. It's one of the um, best Bruce Willis performances of that decade. He nails the Hardigan role. Michael Madsen's good in it. Benicio Del Toro is great in it. Clive Owen is fucking cool in it. I was disappointed that Clive Owen wasn't in the sequel. They had to recast him. And, you know, Josh Brolin's cool, but 
which is weird that he's taking over Clive Owen's role. And, you know, there's an excuse for it. He got plastic surgery or whatever, but I don't know. I, I don't really... It's still weird, you know. Jessica Alba is, again, fine. I don't know. I don't. She doesn't really do much for me, but her role works. Brittany Murphy is really good in it. Nick Offerman has a little role early on in his career before people knew who he was. You might not even know he's in it because he doesn't look like him. He's got the crazy getup. He's just like one of the goons who gets killed. I forgot the actor's name, but the samurai girl, she's super badass. She doesn't have any dialogue or anything. She also came back in, I think, Machete or maybe Machete Kills. She's in one of them as well, but in a, in a, in a little role. Rosario Dawson is great in this, too. She returns for the sequel. Oh, and Elijah Wood is so great as Kevin in this. I love this role. It's another mute character, but he's so good as this, like, creepy... It's honestly one of my favorite Elijah Wood roles, even though he's not doing too much. Like, he doesn't have any dialogue, but he just conveys such a, like, stone-cold psychopath energy. He does a really good job with it. He brings a lot to that role even without speaking. And there's a little behind-the-scenes detail I love. The first shot of Elijah Wood's character, he's all in shadow. It's like silhouette, and his glasses are just like white, and you only see like his, he's like rim-lit, right? Rodriguez, to keep it a mystery a little bit longer than it's Elijah Wood, he thought his profile is too recognizable. So digitally, he took Elijah Wood's chin, the like little silhouette of his chin that you see, and he elongated it a little bit to make his profile not look like Elijah Wood's profile. You don't really notice until you see what it looked like before. This is him before, and then this is him after. I just did a little bit of a change on his shift on his chin. He has a very recognizable chin. And I wanted him, when he was in silhouette especially, not to be so recognizable. And uh, he liked the result quite a bit. Oh, I didn't even mention uh, Mickey Rourke as Marv, like one of the most badass movie characters ever. There are so many moments that are unbelievably badass in this movie. It's such a good grasp of that. The absolute coolest moment in this, and it's a contender for like coolest movie character moment in all of cinema, is when Marv's in the electric chair and they flip the switch and fry him. And it, he just, he survives the electric chair. And he's like, is that all you got? You pansy. And they have to electrocute him a second time. So unbelievably cool. It's great. Uh, the movie's excellent. It made me check out the Sin City graphic novels, which are uh, a lot of fun as well. And there's, there's a bunch of extra ones too. Um, this is an S tier movie. It's so good. It, the visual style is great. They really nailed the stylized black and white, like noir uh, aesthetic of the piece. Um, the use of color, like the, the, the yellow bastard being yellow and everything black and white. And then the sparse use of uh, red blood as opposed to like white blood and other moments. Excellent movie. It's one of the few movies that is like completely shot on a green screen that works and it makes sense for the style. Like watching the behind the scenes is crazy. It's even more green screen than you would think. Like even when they're just like in a apartment, chances are they're probably on a, a green screen stage. Oh, a little Tarantino connection here. Tarantino directed one scene of this movie. They called him a special guest director. Uh, I think the purpose of that was Rodriguez was trying to introduce Tarantino to like digital filmmaking and working on a green screen and stuff. So Tarantino came on set, directed one scene, and I don't think Tarantino liked it, but he still got that experience. Rodriguez is like showing him how it worked and all that. Yeah, it's one of the few instances of an all green screen set working out really well. I'm, I'm not really a fan of that type of filmmaking, but it works for Sin City, and it does make sense given how stylized it is. Okay, next up is another one that's probably lesser seen. This is Two Scoops. This is a short film. And it is not good at all. It is, unfortunately, one of the worst things he's made. It is the two cousins who are, or, um, it is not cousins. I think they're his nieces. They're Rodriguez's nieces who were also in Planet Terror and Grindhouse. They were like the babysitter twins. They're related to Rodriguez. I don't remember if they're his cousins or his nieces or something. But again, there's something weird about how like sexualized they are in his movie given that they're related to him that's a, a weird thing with Rod rodriguez is that side of things but anyway it's those two again they're not particularly good actors but they're not awful i guess the premise is just stupid <laughs> the whole thing with this movie is um it's like an experiment to there is this whole thing where like you could be in the movie make the movie with rodriguez right i think it was crowdfunded and all that and one of the things was like if you donate to the movie, you can get you can be in the movie. And by in the movie, they mean at one point there's like a corkboard full of wanted posters, and the wanted posters are like the headshots of the people who donated to the movie. It's like cheesy, goofy. A lot of crowdfunded movies do that kind of thing. The movie itself is just like it's not good. The, the action is weak. Um, the visual effects are bad. It's too reliant on the visual effects, and that's what kills the action. And it's also just like 
too goofy the tone it doesn't doesn't really work uh, this is I would go E with it next up is the faculty this is one that doesn't really feel like a Robert Rodriguez movie I think it was a director for hire situation it was kind of early on in his career when he didn't like have the power to do whatever whatever project he wanted. He was like taking on studio assignments. I think that was the case with the faculty. Like it wasn't a passion project for him. A little under the radar. I don't know if it's exactly underrated, but it's definitely not talked about a lot. But if you look around, I do see some love for this movie every once in a while. I think it has like a cult following. And it's pretty good. It's enjoyable. A simple, it feels, it's simple. It feels of its time. And it feels kind of cliche, but it's doing some fun things. And... I think it nails the tone of what it's trying to do. Like, it's got a lot of humor in it. And it is also balancing out the sci-fi and, like, light horror aspects. The cast is surprisingly strong. It has a couple people that he would work with in other projects. Like, Elijah Wood is in this in a bigger role than he had in Sin City. I think Josh Hartnett is in this and also in uh, Sin City. And then it has some weird picks. Like, um, John Stewart is in this. He didn't do a ton of acting outside of, you know, like he's, this is like daily show stuff, but he's in this as one of the teachers. The faculty is, it's simple. It's pretty straightforward. It doesn't exactly feel like Rodriguez. Well, so I say that. It doesn't feel like him in terms of the story or like subject matter, but it does feel like him in terms of the cinematography and the editing. I would say his editing style is, is pretty apparent. And he has a a distinctive editing style, like the way he cuts action and the way he cuts together any scene that has like energy to it where there's a lot of movement going on and the way he like moves the camera, that feels like Rodriguez to a T. Um, I think it's right about on par with Road Racers. I think they were from around that time where he didn't like have 100% creative control, you know? It's enjoyable, it's worth a watch. Um, it's like a sci-fi kind of, it's a good like rainy day kind of movie, I would say. Okay, next up is Planet Terror. I talked about Planet Terror a bit when I talked about um, Death Proof on my Tarantino tier list. Um, Planet Terror is the first half of the Grindhouse Double Feature. That Grindhouse Double Feature is like one of my favorite things ever. I absolutely love the whole package. The individual films on their own, I always watch them in the Double Feature package, and that's how I would recommend other people watch them as well. It obviously makes it a longer uh, viewing experience, but I think it's worth it to get that full picture. I mean, obviously each film, Death Proof and Planet Terror, do stand alone. They do work on their own. Planet Terror is a ton of fun. It's way more over the top than Death Proof is. Death Proof is a more like authentic kind of throwback to the like 70s car exploitation movies, whereas Planet Terror is heightening so much the Grindhouse film elements. It doesn't really at all actually feel like a real Grindhouse movie. It's, it feels like a parody of those, whereas Death Proof feels like it could be like an authentic entry in that uh, era of like genre filmmaking. Planet Terror is like way over the top, way more over the top. It's exaggerating things intentionally. It's still a ton of fun, but if you're looking for like authenticity, Death Proof is closer. Planet Terror really plays up, but it's got the like scratchy film aesthetic, which I love though, you know. It's a ton of fun. The cast is really good. Rose McGowan is great in the lead role. Her and Rodriguez were in a relationship at the time, or they were like right after. I think there's kind of a, a not great behind the scenes thing where Rodriguez was married to someone else and then he made this movie with Rose McGowan and then I think he like had an affair with McGowan and he ended up divorcing his wife for her or something that isn't isn't great. But but anyway, Jeff Fahey is really good on this. This made me a fan of Jeff Fahey who comes back in Machete. Jeff Fahey is great uh, in of all things, he's great in Psycho 3. He's really good in of all movies. I love that the sheriff's department in this is comprised of Carlos from El Mariachi, uh, Tom freaking Savini, and Michael Bean, you know, Kyle Reese from The Terminator, uh, Hicks from Aliens. It's like, what a crazy trio of people. I, I love that. Tom Savini is great in it. Uh, Tom Savini, I forgot to mention when I was talking about, like, um, he's in Machete. He's a fun character. Osiris Amanpour, I think is his name. From Dust Till Dawn, of course. He's the guy with the dick gun. He's a sex machine, which is such a fun character. Um, and of course, he's a special effects legend. I don't think I, I think, I think Savini's well, uh, well known enough that I don't need to say who he is. Savini's a total legend, love that guy. Josh Brolin is great in this as well. This was, I think, the first movie where I really took note of Josh Brolin. I was like, oh, I love this guy. Because I, I think this came out around the same time as No Country for Old Men, which kind of like 
set his career on the course that it came out. They might even be like the same year. Oh, I love that Sheriff Earl McGraw uh, shows up in this. Now, interestingly, Sheriff Earl McGraw is a character that is shared between Rodriguez and Quentin Tarantino. He's in both of their, like in their shared cinematic universe. And the thing I love is, slight spoiler here, I'm going to kind of spoil Planet Terror and From Dusk Till Dawn. And I've talked about this in other movies. I think I talked about it in my Tarantino tier list, but I will recap it real quick. Sheriff Earl McGraw dies in From Dusk Till Dawn. He gets blasted in the back of the head and he gets his brain blown out in From Dusk Till Dawn and the place burns down with him inside it. He dies definitively in From Dusk Till Dawn. He is in Planet Terror. He survives Planet Terror because he already died in From Dusk Till Dawn, right? Planet Terror, the end of the movie, I'm spoiling it now, ends with the entirety of civilization crumbling. The, the zombie outbreak destroys the entire world and they have to like rebuild anew, right? The fact that he then dies in From Dusk Till Dawn means that he lived through the entirety of Planet Terror and it turns out that, oh, the world recovered. The world didn't really end because society rebuilt and repopulated and he went back to work as a, as a Texas uh, law, uh, lawman and then he got killed in, uh, in uh, Benny's world of liquor. <laughs> Planet Terror does have a happy ending after all, it turns out. And of course, you know, maybe it's just not canon or whatever, but anyway, uh, I love Planet Terror. It's better within the Grindhouse package. I'm gonna give it an A. Um, and this one is decidedly not for everyone. This is more so than his other movies. Planet Terror is like not for everyone. And you can say that about the entire Grindhouse experience. If you like Machete, Planet Terror is very much that energy. It's that type of over the top, that type of humor. There's lots of great gore effects, uh, lots of fun. Uh, oh, Bruce Willis has a really fun small role in this. The story behind that, apparently after they made Sin City together, Bruce Willis told Rodriguez like, I owe you one. Like, that was such a great movie. I will be in, you know, whatever movie you want me to in the future. And Rodriguez cashed in that favor on Planet Terror. And he ha he put him in that ridiculous role. Yeah, lots of great action. The machine gun leg is so great. And it's really well utilized. He does lots of creative things with it. Actually, the machine gun leg comes in later than you might expect, given that it's on the poster and all that. For a lot of the movie, well, first she just has her leg. Then she loses her leg and gets replaced with a wooden table leg. And then eventually it becomes the machine gun leg. But anyway, all that stuff is is super fun but again it's it's not it's not for everyone you got to be on board with that level of like over the top ridiculous intentional cheese okay next up is the sin city sequel which is sin city a dame to kill for uh it makes sense that this would happen and like there's plenty of other sin city graphic novels to pull from um and in between the first sin city and this movie a whole lot of years went by and in between they made that movie the spirit which was adapted from, you know, it's another Frank Miller thing. Frank Miller is the guy who made the original comics. And The Spirit was already like a spiritual sequel to Sin City. And, and I'm not saying spiritual as like a pun. And, you know, people, the way people say spiritual successor. Um, it was that. And it also happens to be called The Spirit. That movie I don't think really worked. I think that was a bit of a misfire. And I put that on the director. I think the cast was solid. Um, like Sam Jackson's in there as a... Mr. Octopus or whatever with the big guns and stuff. There's fun stuff in the spirit, but I don't think it works. If you're a fan of Sin City, like I was, I found that a big left. I remember seeing that in the theater and just being horribly disappointed by it. And then Sin City, Dame to Kill For, is the direct sequel to Sin City. It's pulling from more of the Sin City graphic novels. There is also one plot line in it that is like a completely new creation that isn't pulled from one of the graphic novels. I'm not exactly sure why, um, because there is plenty that could be pulled from the graphic novels. Like even still, they could do a third movie and there's more to pull from. The one that was made for the movie, I think is the, the vignette that follows Joseph Gordon-Levitt. I think it's his, which is a pretty good good one. Like I like the gambling stuff. I love the way they do his uh, his coin flipping, you know, and Powers Booth is great in that supporting role. I'm going to come out and say I like Sin City Dame to Kill For more than most people seem to. The general consensus on this movie was it got a, a lot of hate. And I will say it's nowhere near as good as the first movie. Um, it's, it's a step backwards in a lot of ways. Even in terms of like the visuals, you would think after so many years, the visuals would be either as good or improved, like refined to a point of perfection, but it does. It looks cheaper. It doesn't look as good. I think something happened with Rodriguez later in his career where he kind of started prioritizing visual effects in a way that is like putting too much emphasis on them. And it starts to feel like kind of lazy in some ways, or like at least like the effects look cheap. They don't look great. Um, and he relies on them a lot more in his later movies. Since he didn't become for suffers from that 
it doesn't look as good as the original Sin City, which should not be the case given all the years that went by. I think it's better than people give it credit for, but it is a step in the wrong direction. Also, some of the performances are a little weaker. Like again, Jessica Alba, I, I do like the evolution of her character. I think that's really interesting and it's a cool thing to do in a sequel to see like how she changed in that way and make her darker, but I, I don't think she really pulls it off. I guess, I, I don't know, I guess I just don't think she's the best actor in the world. So she's a bit of a weak link, but Rosario Dawson's good. Mickey Rourke is still good. Marv is still a, a really cool, badass character. He's not he's not as badass. Like, he doesn't have as big of, like, moments. Bruce Willis is, like, technically in the movie, but he's basically, like, a ghost that we see flashes of, so he's not really doing much. I mean, the first one was a, was a vignette film as well with, like, isolated stories, but it felt cohesive in a way that the second one doesn't feel cohesive. It feels more detached, each storyline from the other. In A Day to Kill For, they feel pretty separated in a way that isn't necessarily bad, but it isn't as smooth as the first one. Also, I think the storytelling is just like a, a little bit of a step back, but it's still, it's just, there's still good stuff. There's still cool moments. There's still some fun action. Like Marv is still cool. Um, Josh Brolin's good, even though it feels weird that he's replacing Clive Owen. I don't know if there's a story why Clive Owen wasn't in it or if they just recast him because of the plastic surgery storyline. Like, I don't know if the plastic surgery was made because they needed to recast Clive Owen, or if they recast Clive Owen because of the plastic surgery. It's a chicken and egg thing. I don't know which one was first. I remember trying to look it up before not finding anything. I'll try again, and if I find something, I will include a screenshot in the edit right now. So there you go, there's your answer, or not. And there's still some like great, hard-boiled noir dialogue. Like, my favorite line in it that pops to mind right now is, I don't remember the exact wording, but there's something about how uh, Brolin gets knocked unconscious and then he talks about how he he gets like thrown from a car or maybe from a window and he talks about how he like wakes up in midair. That's just such a cool line. So there's still really cool stuff. It isn't as good as the first one, like not even close. But I do think it's, I think there's more merit to it than some people gave it credit for. I saw it twice. I enjoyed it both times. This new one, I mean. I saw it in theaters and then I, bought the DVD and watched it again and still enjoyed it. Its biggest issue is just how late of a sequel it is. Like, I feel like if this came out much closer to the first movie, it might have done better. I also think Rodriguez was kind of firing on all cylinders at that point in his career, whereas now, like I said, I think he's a, become a little too reliant on visual effects. Um, like, the kind of, like, cheap visual effects, I mean. Obviously, since it was packed with visual effects. Uh, I might go as high as B tier on it. Um, I think I'm actually going to go C, though. Okay, next up is Four Rooms. I'll keep this Four Rooms one quick. One, because the tier list is already pretty long, and also because I've already talked about it at length in my Tarantino tier list. I'm pretty sure I already talked about Rodriguez's section in that one as well. Four Rooms, just to go through real quick. Four Rooms is a vignette film divided up into four distinct chapters, each from a different writer-director, and then there's a wraparound framing device with Tim Roth's Ted the Bellhop character. Rodriguez's uh, quarter of the movie is the third room, and it has some of his regulars. It has Antonio Banderas. Uh, it also technically has Selma Hayek, even though you wouldn't know it's her. There's like they're like watching TV at some point. There's like someone dancing on TV, and that's Selma Hayek's body. I don't think you see her face, but that is her. Uh, the kids aren't great actors, but they're well utilized. So the Rodriguez segment is it's called the misbehavior, the misbehaviors, and it is it builds to a wonderful crescendo that is hilarious. The buildup isn't like perfect. It's a little like goofy and a little kitty, but the payoff is so worth it. It's such an explosive payoff to this segment. And I would say it's probably the funniest of the four segments, though I do think Tarantino's is a stronger overall segment. Four Rooms is extremely uneven. The Rodriguez and Tarantino segments are really good, and I would actually put them in the size like A. The other two segments are both a big step down, especially the first segment. It does not get off on a good foot. That first segment is like E. The next one's probably D, and then Rodriguez and Tarantino are either both A or Tarantino's A and Rodriguez is B. Um, I'll put it overall on B. I'm going to give them the benefit of like focusing on their sections. It's, it's fun. It's worth watching if you're a fan of those directors. Next up is Machete Kills. This one was so disappointing for me. And I've seen it three times now. Because the first time I watched it, I, I was so crushed. And then I went to watch it again. And I still didn't like it. I actually, I feel like I was kind of like lying to myself the first time I watched it because I, I didn't like it. And I was trying to be like, 
no, it was good. I just, I wasn't, I was in a, the wrong mood for it or something. And then I watched it a second time and confirmed like, oh yeah, it's just not as good. And um, one of the big issues with it is that it is full of awful CG and like visual effects. And like, maybe that's okay in, in one movie, but it does not work in a movie that's meant to be a throwback to these grindhouse movies of the 70s, like that predate computer digital effects. You can't put that in here. Like, and the first Machete was smart enough to not have a bunch of visual effects. I mean, there's still some in there, but it's... First off, they, they pass, and that they don't, like, jump out at you as, like, bad CG, and there's a lot of good practical effects. Machete Kills is, like, loaded with so much visual effects that looks bad. Like, it looks like, you know, YouTube from eight years ago. But also, like, the writing is just not as good. The, the jokes are worse. The over-the-top action is all a little bit weaker. There is still some good action. There are still some fun moments, but, like, the cast is a step down. One thing I do like is the El Chameleon character, where it, like, rotates through actors. You have Walton Goggins playing one. I love seeing him. And there's also Cuba Gooding Jr. as one of the chameleons, and then Lady Gaga is one. This was Lady Gaga's first film role, by the way. She's trying to, like, erase this and pretend... There's, like, interviews where she pretends that her first acting role was A Star is Born. And, oh, wasn't it crazy that I got an Oscar for, or nomination or whatever for my first ever acting role? It's like, I'm not forgetting. You were, you were, you were in this, Gaga. You, you, can't, you can't erase this from history. I will not forget. She was also in, like, American Horror Story before A Star is Born, so I don't know how that factors into that, like, narrative she's trying to craft, but whatever. But Jet Day Kills was such a disappointment for me. Uh, I was really looking forward to it. And I, I, I will still go into... Machete kills in space if it ever happens with uh, high expectations and be looking for a good time. I still hope that one happens and I still hope it's good. But Machete kills, such a disappointment for me. I'll put it in D. It's not completely without merit, but disappointment. Um, except Shark Boy and Lava Girl. I'll go pretty quick through this because a lot of the same things I said about Spy Kids apply to this one about his how he makes kids movies and stuff. Shark Boy and Lava Girl was the one that as a kid, I watched it, and I did not like this one. I, I thought this one sucked as, as a kid. I don't know what it was about it. I remember thinking that the um, the kid who played Shark Boy sucked, and then he, he had turned out to be Taylor Lott, or the Twilight kid. I don't think I knew that at this point, because this was before that. But um, And he does suck. He's a bad, bad actor in everything I've seen him in. I think as a kid, I thought Lava Girl was the same girl from Spy Kids, but it isn't. They just look kind of similar. It is a different... Or the girl who plays Lava Girl didn't do like anything else until We Can Be Heroes, where she reprised the role of Lava Girl. And Taylor Lautner did not reprise Shark Boy. They got some other guy in there. That's why he's like wearing a mask so you can't see. This one is no good. Even as a kid, I didn't like it. I think it's, it might have just been because I was a little older by the time this one came out as compared to like the first two Spy Kids movies. But this one I, I did not like as a kid. Um, and I, I still watched it a few times because like, I think as a kid, you even just like watch stuff you don't really like all that much. Something about being a kid, I think that happens. But I liked it even less than Spy Kids 3. Um, I might go all the way to F with this one, honestly. And when I look back at a couple clips from it, it was like, how the hell was this released considering these VFX acceptable? Like, the the visual effects are especially bad in this one. Which, like, as a kid, maybe you don't notice that they're that bad, but, like, this is a hideous movie. It looks so bad. Next up is From Rust Till Dawn, the TV series. This one hasn't been talked about as much as the other things. I watched the entire first season of this show. I think it got maybe three seasons. It at least got two seasons, and I didn't watch the subsequent seasons. I don't think it's great. I don't think it's awful, though. It could have been a whole lot worse. Interesting to take the concept of From Rust Till Dawn and expand it into a TV show, because it doesn't really seem like a concept that would work as a TV show. And it doesn't really, I mean, the premise of it does, isn't really conducive to a TV show. They make it work in, in the same sense that, like, you could take something like the Fargo movie and expand that kind of tone and that idea of, like, true crime in big old air quotes into a TV series. So it's kind of along, along those lines. Could have been a lot worse. It's not great, though. Um, it takes this, the exact premise of the movie, and it's basically, like, remaking the film, but expanding on each scene in each element of it. So instead of like the first half of the movie being all the crime thriller stuff where they like cross the border and all that and then the second half being the bar in Mexico, there are now several episodes that are just a crime thriller plot and there are like new subplots added and then the whole second half of the season is like we're in the bar and it, 
it delves deeper into like the Mayan ruins that are basically just like a visual at the end of the movie. They're now a part of the TV series, which is interesting. I actually wouldn't be opposed to going back and watching the next season of the show. It's just kind of hard to find because it was on the El Rey Network thing. So, but I would watch it if it popped up on like HBO Max or something. I would watch season two. It has all the characters from the movie, meaning like it has the Gecko brothers. It has Seth and Richie Gecko, who were Tarantino acting and um, George Clooney in the uh, in the uh, in the movie. Now it's these two other guys who are not great actors. Um, the guy who's in Clooney's role, Seth Gecko, he's like doing a George Clooney impression, and it's a little. I don't know. I kind of wish he just did his own thing. If you know what I mean, the guy doing Tarantino's role is nowhere near as good as Tarantino's performance, which I think is like shockingly good. And from Dusk Till Dawn, Tarantino's acting, I think he gives a great performance in, as a, as Richie Gecko. Um, the guy in this is like not great, but he's not horrible either. It's just kind of like instead of doing their own thing and making the characters their own, it does feel like they're trying to mimic what Clooney and Tarantino did in the roles previously, which is just a little off. Like it feels like they're doing impressions, kind of. More so with the Clooney guy than the other guy. Uh, Jacob, who in the movie was Harvey Keitel, is now Robert Patrick, which I think is a cool bit of casting. He does a good job. Um, there's also uh, Jake Busey, who is Gary Busey's son. If you didn't know, Jake Busey is Gary Busey's son. Gary Busey is the, you know, that, that nutcase actor that people love to like laugh at. Jake Busey is his son, and he's actually a pretty good actor. He's had some good roles in, uh, in different things. He's okay in this. There's also Wilmer Valderrama is in a big role. And his wardrobe is insane and like worth watching for his wardrobe. There's one scene that sticks out in my mind where he is just inexplicably wearing a humongous gold cowboy hat in like a sequins golden like cowboy jumpsuit with these big huge boots. And it's just like one scene he's wearing that walking around and then he's like out of it again later on and it goes completely uncommented on it. It's so bizarre. Anyway, it's not a great series. It feels like uh, maybe not cheap, but like they didn't really have the budget to do the scale of the movie on an episodic, protracted basis. It does draw things out more than they need to. It's okay. Uh, I think I would go D with it. I, I could maybe be generous and give it a C, but I think I'm going to go D. Okay, next up is Alita Battle Angel. Now, I will say, if I wasn't going to do a tier list on Rodriguez, I don't think I would have ever watched this one. This is just so thoroughly not my kind of movie. Uh, if you see my other tier lists or my other reviews and whatnot, you know I don't like big blockbuster movies a lot of the time. They're just, like, not my kind of thing. Like, if you enjoy them, good on you. Have fun. I don't really enjoy, like, the Marvel movies, for example, the big superhero movies. And Alita is definitely a huge blockbuster. It's the biggest budget Rodriguez has worked with by many leagues. This was produced by James Cameron. At one point, James Cameron was going to direct it, and then he ended up getting busy with the Avatar sequels, and it was, like, one or the other instead of letting the project die, he gave it to Rodriguez. And I guess they had been wanting to work together for a while on something. And you can feel the James Cameron influence. It has that gloss and it has, like if you look at the behind the scenes stuff, which I again did, James Cameron had done a lot of groundwork as far as like the design elements of it go. And he was deeply involved in crafting the story in terms of the adaptation. This is adapted from a manga. Cameron is a big fan of the manga, I guess, and he helped adapt it. He helped craft the storyline, which I think is pulling from like a couple of different volumes of the manga and turning it into one cohesive story. Now it does feel kind of episodic. It almost feels like a movie and its sequel. And then it ends on a cliffhanger that they might do sequels to. I don't know if they will end up doing the sequels. It's been a few years at this point. I think the movie was quite successful though, so it might happen. Um, and I know James Cameron wanted to do the sequels. There's interview clips of him talking about how he wants to do like an endless string of Alita movies, like how he wants to do a whole bunch of Avatar sequels. I guess that's just his thing now. But he's you can feel his influence in like the sci-fi elements, like the the design of like the battle suits and stuff feels very James Cameron. Whereas Rodriguez is more exaggerated and like cartoony, because he has a background as a cartoonist. If you didn't know, he used to be a, a cartoonist. And like you can see that if you look at his storyboards, Rodriguez's storyboards, they have like a cartoon aesthetic and they look really cool like they could be like if you did more of them they could eventually become a graphic novel or something he also animated the um bumper with the panther in grindhouse he animated that little sequence which is a fun little trivia factoid alita i think is 
I would say it's really good for what it is. It's just not at all my kind of movie. I do think it's well made. And as far as like this type of movie, I mean, I enjoyed it more than I would enjoy like the average movie of this scope. It's just at a scale, like a scope level that is that I don't personally uh, like, but it's pretty good. Um, I thought that big exaggerated like anime eyes for, for Alita would be distracting the whole movie, but I actually got used to them like immediately. She looks great as far as like the visuals go. Like she's basically a fully CG character. She looks really good actually as far as a CG character goes. Believable. Like you stop thinking about her being a CG character pretty quickly. Like the difference in CG quality between this and like Machete Kills is so vast. And that's owing to the, you know, I'm having an astronomically higher budget for this one. Um, the like motorball sequences are fun. There's some cool action. They push the violence pretty far considering it's like a PG-13 movie as opposed to his usual rated R fair. So, you know, it could have been worse in that regard. This is not really my kind of movie. I'm going to give it a C for my like personal enjoyment. If you're into this kind of the big scope spectacle movies, you'd enjoy it more. I'll say that. Okay, Whew, I'm exhausted. This is a very long tier list. This might be my, I don't know if this is my longest one so far or what, but I'm exhausted. Okay. Like, last up is Rebel Without a Crew. This is his book, not to be confused with the Rebel Without a Crew series. I think he called his making of series for Red 11. I think he called Rebel Without a Crew as well, but it has some kind of subtitle. This is the book I'm reading because I haven't, I haven't watched the whole behind the scenes series, but I have read his book. I read his book multiple times and I read it a long time ago. Like I got this book. I sought it out back in high school when I was first getting like seriously getting into filmmaking, considering that as like a, what I wanted to do in the future. I read this book. Lots of great insights to be gleaned from this. And it's also just a fascinating story. It's uh, structured like a diary, which I think a lot of it was. He like kept a detailed journal throughout his making of process, including the I Was a Human Lab Rat section, which is like a chapter in this, which is the thing he went through. And then that basically f became the basis of Red 11. If you don't know the story of how Rodriguez got the $7,000 to make El Mariachi is he sold his body to science, essentially. He took part in an experimental clinical trial where they were like testing drugs on him. And, and he like lived in this medical facility for a time and he made the $7,000 that way. And it's just such like a, a cool, scrappy, like, yeah, fuck yeah, movies kind of story. Like, yeah, filmmaking, like that indie spirit. So it's really cool on that level. Knowing that backstory is part of what made me excited and hopeful for Red Eleven, and then I was really disappointed because they say that Red Eleven is based on his experiences in there. And he even says that in the intro, and it's at the beginning of the movie where he like plugs the behind the scenes series and all that. He talks about how it's based on his experiences in the trial, but then like you watch the movie and it's like, no, it fucking wasn't. Like, I feel like it's a missed opportunity. He could have actually made a compelling movie based on that experience, like a good drama, but instead he turned it into this sci-fi thing where there's a conspiracy and the drugs gave them magical telekinesis powers and shit, and it's just like, okay, that's, I don't know. I feel like there is potential for a good story in telling his experience there, and instead he did this other thing that squandered the potential of it. But anyway, that's, that's enough about Red 11. Rebel Without a Crew is a great read, and I would recommend it to anyone who's interested in filmmaking. Um, especially if you're working with, like, no budget. Like, the Rebel Without a Crew aesthetic meant a lot to me uh, when I was doing my, like, stuff back in high school. Because I was doing the one-person crew thing where, you know, I was working the camera and I was, like, doing the makeup and shit, even though I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and there's a lot to be learned from it. A lot of insights. And while I'm talking about this, I'm also going to say pair this with his 10-minute film school series. Um, you can find them on the special features of the DVDs for like a bunch of his movies, but you can also just find them on YouTube now. I don't know how many there are, but there's like a few. There's at least like three or four or, or five or whatever. Um, some of them might be called five-minute film school as opposed to 10-minute. I think they're different lengths, so, you know, change up your search key phrase to make sure you find them all. But there's so many great insights to be gleaned from that and, and just like tricks for like saving money and tricks for like shooting quickly. Like I, I learned a lot from it. I want to put this in S tier. I think this is like a vital resource for young filmmakers. And that is where I rank Rodriguez's filmography. I can't believe it is such an even spread of like every tier. <laughs> it's crazy the amount of uh, variance. He has a lot of great work and then he has some not so great work. Excellent filmmaker. I mean, as you can tell from how I talk about the guy, he means a lot to me in my like just personal journey as like learning about movies and filmmaking. 
I'm exhausted. I still want to keep this outro quick. This is a long one. I'm tired. Uh, check out my other tier list. Subscribe right here to Brickwall Pictures. And uh, I'll see you in the next video. So long.